that, I wrote that essay at a time when um, the intelligent design movement was garnering headlines weekly. And the intelligent design movement, in case you had forgotten or never knew or weren't paying attention, but you're, you're a newspaper reading crowd, so I'm sure you were all there. Um, intelligent design is the assertion that there are things about nature that are so intricate, so sort of brilliant in concept, that it just couldn't have, and, and so defying of the methods and tools of science to decode, that it must have had the hand of an intelligent designer. An intelligent in that reference refers to something vastly more intelligent than our feeble human minds. And so that's the premise. And so you go around, look through nature, oh, that's one of those. That's intelligently designed. That's an intelligent design. Now, it's hard to separate the invocation of the word intelligent in that sentence with a reference to some, somebody's God. So you have to ask, is this a religious movement or is it a movement of some pure uh, philosophy un, untouched by religion? You have to ask that. And the courts ask that of the movement. And the famous court case in Dover, Pennsylvania, um, November, uh, just, just last November, where the school district tried to bring intelligent design into the science classroom as a science plan, as part of the science curriculum. And the judge read the evidence for and against intelligent design and basically threw the court case out. They threw it out. Wrote a 135, 150-page statement about why science, to do science, you need data and evidence and discovery and this sort of thing. And intelligent design didn't fulfill that. So here was this debate going on. And I normally, I don't jump into debates unless I think I have something unique to contribute. If you've got a lot of voices, I'm okay. Go, do it. Let me find something that needs voices, okay? That one didn't really need my voice. There were plenty of people arguing. But then I thought, wait a minute. It's missing something. I've got to address this. And you know what it's missing? Intelligent design, that's, the, that's what you call it today. But as an idea, it's been around for thousands of years. In A.D. 150, Claudius Ptolemy, one of the architects of the geocentric universe, Earth in the middle. It was, happened to be a wrong model, but it was brilliantly wrong. And it forced people to think about what's going on in the motions of the objects of the night sky. When he looked up, he'd see the planets move. This is pre-Newton, of course. He'd see the planets move, and then they'd slow down, stop, and then go backwards. And then slow down, stop, and then continue forward again. Nobody understood this. This is like a mystery. So Ptolemy would look up, and he penned these words in the manuscript of his greatest work. He said, when I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies, the planets in that case, I no longer touch earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. Now that's beautiful. There he's basking in the majesty of his God, Zeus, almost in celebration of his ignorance. I don't know what this is, but surely somebody does. That's Zeus. And I'm here with him. So that's a form of intelligent design. He looks at something he can't figure out. His tools available to him do nothing for him. So he says, Zeus did it. Let's move forward. I'm going to leave some people out, but they're more of the same examples. The essay has them all. Let me fast forward to Isaac Newton. We're now going forward, you know, 1,700 years, 1,600 years. Go for, fast forward to Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton's my man. I think he's the smartest person to ever walk this earth. And I'm not alone in that assessment. Now, if you want to fight me on that, we can do that. I'll give you just one example, and then they'll just, just to sort of temper you if you're ready to go to fisticuffs, because like Einstein's your man, or Leonardo, or whomever, I'm going to set you straight, okay? Isaac Newton discovers, well, first he's got to put the indigo in there. I get that, gets that out of the way. <laughs> 
Then, all right, actually he did that second, but uh, he discovered the laws of motion and the laws of gravity. And someone comes up to him and says, uh, Ike, I don't know if he went by Ike, but sounds better. Ike, why do planets orbit in the shape of ellipses and not some other shape? An ellipse is a kind of squashed circle. So he looks and he says, you know, because by the way, his, his, his equations of gravity give you ellipses. And so, but he, he said, well, you know, I don't know. I'll get back to you. So he goes back home to his home in Lincolnshire, which is out of way triple suburbs of London. I, I, Newton was avoiding the plague that was running through London, killing many, many people. He left London. Newton was smart, okay? He left London. <laughs> people are dying. You leave, okay? <laughs> First indication of how smart the man is. He left London, went to a hillside, a home in Lincolnshire, Goes back, I forgot how long this took, but it wasn't very long. It was, you counted in months, not in years. So he goes back, figures out why his planets go in ellipses, and he comes back and says, I figured out, here's why. And his friend, who he corresponded with by mail, said, uh, that's great, what did, you, what did you have to do to figure this out? He said, oh, I had to invent integral and differential calculus, and that helped me solve this answer. <laughs> We struggle with our calculus class, and Newton invents it on a dare just to get something else done. <laughs> and he did this before he turned 26. Here's Newton. So I, I think I made it clear to you what I think of the man. So he solves his equations for gravity and says, okay, there's, it's, it's a two-body problem. So he's got, he figured out Earth-Moon and the orbit, figured out the sun and the Earth. He's got it. He figured it out. Figured out the sun in each of the planets. But then he realized that as Earth comes around the bend, and Jupiter happens to be out there, that not only is the sun and Earth pulling on each other, Jupiter is tugging on Earth. Every time we come around the back stretch, Jupiter is tugging. And I come around, I go, I go a little further because Jupiter went further, and I come around, I get the tug again. And so he looked at this. We got the major gravity, and then we have these minor tugs. And he tried his best to figure this out. He said, this system is unstable. You keep this up, the orbits will get distorted out of recognition, and Earth would fly off into space. Yet somehow we're all still here. And somehow the orbits are pretty circular. In their, so they're ellipses, but not bad ellipses. So something is keeping things stable. And for the first time in his entire record, of its discovery of the laws of mechanics and the laws of gravity. In this tome, one of the greatest science books ever written, and it's called Principia. In that, for the first time, Isaac Newton says, God must step in and fix things. He didn't mention God talking about his formula F equals MA, his formula for motion. He didn't talk about God when he knew and figured out the motions of the planets and its universal law of gravity. God is nowhere to be found. He gets to a point where he can't answer the question, God is there. That's intelligent design. Something he couldn't figure out. There it is. He didn't say, maybe someone else smarter than I will, will figure this out one day. It's not what he said. And so, <coughs> this concept of reaching the limits of your knowledge and then saying, God is there, is old. It's not new. It didn't first show up in Dover, Pennsylvania. And we're not talking about uneducated people here. We're talking about some of the most brilliant minds the world has ever produced. So, so now what happened? Let's fast forward. It took 130 years, but somebody was finally born who could solve that problem. Simon Pierre de Laplace, a brilliant French mathematician of the late 18th century. In the last three years of the 18th century, he produced a five-volume tome called Celeste Mécanique, or Mécanique, Celestial Mechanics in English. Uh, but he's French, so it, that's what it was. So in there, he studies the stability of the solar system, invents a new, or develops, 
perfects a new branch of calculus called perturbation theory. And what he says is, okay, I can figure it out. Set up the equation this way. You've got the main force, and now you have these little tugs. Represent all these little tugs by this term in this equation. Now crank the equation. And when you do that, it turns out the little tugs don't amount to much. They all cancel out. And so that, in fact, the solar system is stable beyond Newton's projections for it. Napoleon, who's a contemporary of Laplace, summoned up this document. Napoleon, he wasn't just a little tyrant. He studied engineering and physics so that he would know where his cannonballs would drop. Okay? That's at least half the reason why he was successful. You go to his library, which, which I visited, it's a whole wall of just physics and engineering and, and, and uh, what's the study of uh, materials? Um, metallurgy and metallurgy. All on the wall. So he summons up Laplace said, this is a brilliant piece of work. And Napoleon was smart enough to have read this book, knew enough math to have read this book and gotten the main gist of it. He said, Laplace, this is a brilliant piece of work, but you make no mention of the architect of the system. And Laplace replied, sir, I had no need for that hypothesis. And so here you have a delay of 130 years of a problem that previously was ascribed to the handiwork of God now was no longer an assumption. And it gets solved by somebody who's brilliant. And so what we've learned over all of these examples, and there are tons of them one can cite, is that intelligent design is a philosophy of ignorance. It is you get to something that you don't understand, and then you stop. You say, God did it, and you no longer progress beyond that point. And you're going to wait around. Now, here's what's, here's the, here's what's, here's what's inexcusably hubristic about that comment. You're going to come to this point, and you're going to say, I can't solve this problem. Neither can anyone who will ever be born after me solve this problem. Therefore, it is intelligently designed. How dare you make that comment? Well, you know, maybe it's true. But I don't want to put you in charge of the, like, Alzheimer's research or of the cancer prevention research. No, I'm going to put you somewhere else. Put you on the factory line or something. I'm going to get you out of that frontier lab because... The discoveries are not coming from you. And so the issue in Dover should not have been kick ID out of the school system. No, it's, it's weird. People, people have do, invoked it. You don't sweep that under the rug. It's a fascinating part of the chapter of his, in, in history. So put it in the philosophy class. Put it in the religion class. Put it in the history of science class. But because science is a philosophy of discovery, it has no place in the science classroom. And that was my only argument. It simply doesn't belong in the science classroom because it's not science.